so last time we looked at uh, we looked at uh, how the dropout method or the lyman break technique uh, could be used to find uh, lyman break galaxies at high redshift so now uh, here the idea is is very simple you use some property of the of the continuum of the spectral energy distribution to identify candidate uh, galaxies in your desired redshift range and then uh, you go and do spectroscopy because only with spectroscopy can you get very very accurate redshifts right and so you look for absorption lines emission lines in the spectrum uh, and identify identify them correctly and then you will get the exact redshift so this idea is is pretty general and uh, can be used to find other classes of objects so for example there are these extremely red objects uh, how do we define them they have a r minus k color of greater than 5 okay? so they're quite red now if you go and look at go go do deeper imaging uh, go do spectroscopy of these objects you will find that they are roughly half and half of two classes of objects one is uh, elliptical galaxies at redshift one which have a luminosity quite similar to today's ellipticals and are at that epoch already dominated by a old stellar population so these are very likely your big galaxies at the course of clusters because they formed most of their stars uh, 10 giga years ago built up their mass very very rapidly within a giga year or so they built up almost their entire mass and then after that they have been slowly accreting uh, smaller galaxies eating them up but their stellar mass is not changing much and very often the gases uh, the galaxies that are accrete, accreting are themselves devoid of gas and also composed of a older stellar population so uh, these are then dry mergers which lead to increase in the stellar mass without in, uh, any uh, any recent star formation so that's one population uh, the second population is galaxies with active star formation do not show a 4000 angstrom fa break but which feature the emission line of o2 at 3727 angstroms a clear sign of star formation okay so if you see a o2 o2 or o3 line that like the h alpha line or the lyman alpha line are characteristic of of star formation and uh, that indicates uh, uh, and these objects turn out to be extremely red because uh, they are heavily dust obscured and then you say okay let me go and look at them in the radio and the far infrared then you will inevitably invariably find that this is a population of ultra luminous infrared galaxies so this kind of degeneracy is there everywhere, especially except in the high redshift universe where there is no dust. But in the low redshift universe, meaning below redshift two or so, you will always find this degeneracy between <clears throat> redness that is caused by intrinsic uh, phenomenon. That means you have an older stellar population or you have may have a young stellar population and have a lot of dust obscuration that makes it red. So this is so the first population is like a red uh, population. The second population is like a blue population. Inclination can can have an effect, but those kind of effects, no, are there only in individual galaxies. They don't have any phenomenon that is relatively rare. Okay, will not influence the overall statistics. And of course, you can have individual objects that don't, you may even have individual objects, one or two objects that don't fall into these two categories, but are some combination. So something which is partially obscured, but also has a old stellar population. That is possible. But those are rare. What we are saying here is like the broad statistical properties of galaxies. And in studies of galaxy evolution, most of the time we talk about that we talk about the sort of average properties or typical properties we don't get too worked up about the edge cases the extreme cases okay so this idea of using the uh, photometric fluxes to determine the uh, rough redshift 
of a galaxy is known as the photometric redshift technique. Now you can do it. I mean, what we were implicitly doing by making those color color diagrams to identify uh, U dropouts and B dropout galaxies is exactly this. We were using the prop overall continuum uh, photometric features to identify a, uh, a possible spectrum for that galaxy at a possible redshift. <clears throat> now, when you do stellar population synthesis <clears throat> with photometry, then you are automatically required to uh, get a photometric redshift estimate. Right? It's a byproduct of the stellar population synthesis because when you fit this, these data points, you have to find a template that fits it, but you will also have to redshift that template to the correct redshift in order for all the points to line up. Correct? So you get photometric redshifts for free if you do stellar population synthesis using the template fitting method. Of course, there are uh, uh, photometric redshift techniques that don't use uh, don't use template fitting, but they use some kind of machine learning and AI and so on, which we uh, uh, which we didn't look at. But that is also possible. Then you can get a photometric redshift independently. But this is the older technique. This is the more straightforward technique of getting a photometric redshift. And if you have many many measurements like we did for this galaxy it becomes relatively straightforward to get a very robust uh, redshift estimate. Uh, <clears throat> Photo Z for thousands of objects has now been measured. And as I've told you several times during this course, uh, photometry is much cheaper in terms of telescope time uh, because in 10, 15, 20 minutes, you can go very deep with a, with a big telescope. And uh, if you do it in say, four or five filters, you can get reasonably good photometric redshifts. If you want to get spectroscopic redshifts, then you disperse the light. And uh, so, for example, in the Sloan survey, the imaging is done with an exposure time of about 54 seconds per filter. But the uh, spectroscopy is done typically with an exposure time of one hour. So, for the same uh, brightness galaxy, it will take typically two orders of magnitude more time uh, to do spectroscopy relative to photometry. So that is why photometric redshifts are easy. We now have photometric. So this is an example of that. So there are lots of galaxies in this image and every number against the galaxy uh, image tells you the photometric redshift of that galaxy. Right. So what kind of spectrum can we expect from very high redshift uh, galaxies or more likely quasars. So you will see, as we've already seen before, this is just a thing that if you have a very high redshift uh, source, then you will see the Lyman alpha emission from that source. But blueward of the Lyman alpha line, there will be lots of uh, uh, absorption lines uh, corresponding to, uh, there will be neutral hydrogen that will lead to a lot of absorption. And then there will be increasingly uh, larger numbers of H2 regions, H2 bubbles, okay, which, uh, which make the universe easier to travel, traverse through, right? Because then the, the photons, they encounter atoms along the way, but those atoms are already ionized. And so they don't, nothing happens to the photons. So the photons uh, continue there. So, the, so we can, in fact, measure uh, by studying the properties of the Lyman alpha forest, we can study the properties of the intervening absorbers. And uh, uh, eventually, of course, if the universe gets fully ionized and the, uh, the thing becomes free streaming. Okay. So one of the key parameters that one measures when one measures the evolution of the universe is the evolution of the star formation rate over the lifetime of the universe. And uh, when we quantify that, we can do it for an individual galaxy, we can calculate the star formation rate of that individual galaxy. 
But when we are trying to calculate the average or typical star formation rate, what is typically done is that you calculate the density of star formation. And that is defined as the mass of newly formed stars per unit co-moving co volume per year. Right? And so the units will be solar masses per year per megaparsec cube. So if you know rho SFR is a function of redshift, then you know how many stars, <clears throat> because redshift can always be translated into a look back time knowing the cosmology. <coughs> then you know how many stars have formed at uh, any point of uh, time in the universe. And why are we doing co-moving volumes? Because that's the correct thing to do. Okay? As the scale factor of the universe increases with time, uh, the everything, the distances between galaxies automatically increase. So when you want to compare the star formation rate density between now and say redshift of one, you have to take into account the difference in scale factors. So what you typically do scale factors, let's say is one today, then uh, at redshift one, it will be half of that. So the volume will be one eighth. So when you are calculating the volume there, you have to take that one eighth factor into account. <clears throat> So having done this, people have over the last 20, 25 years uh, attempted to measure the evolution of the star formation rate density as a function of uh, redshift or uh, equivalently as a function of the age of the universe or the look back time, or whatever, right? And uh, this is what we see. So these numbers again are in our log of uh, solar masses per year per megaparsec cube. Uh, you can clearly see that in the low redshift universe, as one goes uh, from say redshift zero uh, to redshift one or so, there is a dramatic increase in the star formation rate density. And uh, that increase is uh, of the order of uh, one magnitude or so. Now, depending on how what star formation rate indicators you use to measure the exact nature of this curve can be slightly different okay so in in some places you may find that it increases by one order of magnitude something some places one and a half orders of magnitude to reach one and so on and then it sort of stays relatively flat and then begins to fall beyond reach four or so that uh, so this broad trend is clear that there is a rapid increase out to redshift uh, of one. But remember, this is a sort of log scale. So if you put a linear scale in time, uh, this thing is linear in redshift. Uh, this curve will look a bit different. This this increase is really, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's happening over a five giga year period, right? Or even more. This is referred to as the Lily Madau diagram because Simon Lily and Pierre Madau were the two scientists who first attempted to use uh, uh, data from the Hubble Deep Fields and other observations uh, to actually constrain the star formation rate. And why do we need this? Because the star formation rate density evolution has to be again explained by galaxy formation models. Just like those formation models have to explain the observed luminosity function at every redshift, we have to also explain some correlations that we see, like the Tully Fisher or the Faber Jackson fundamental plane, etc. They also have to explain these simultaneously and self consistently. So you can't have a, a galaxy formation model that works, which will say that, okay, I will explain Lili Madhav diagram, but I can't explain Faber Jackson. Right? Then uh, something is wrong with the model. You need to improve the model so that it explains both of both of these observations. So now when we talk of galaxy formation, we say that uh, there is something known as hierarchical galaxy formation. Uh, so how does that happen? Encounters and mergers of galaxies play a central role in their evolution. And uh, in fact, galaxies are formed by the mergers of smaller galaxies, right? And even apparently isolated galaxies are surrounded by much larger dark halos whose outermost tendrils are linked to the halos of nearby galaxies. 
and because of this because every galaxy sits inside a dark matter halo uh, its gravity remember is determined by the mass of the dark matter halo which always is much larger than the mass baryonic mass of the galaxy so depending on the mass of the dark matter halo the accretion of uh, baryonic matter even dark matter happens so dark matter so just like galaxies are merging dark matter halos are also merging you can have a dark matter small dark matter halo without a galaxy in it but you cannot have a galaxy which is sitting outside of a dark matter halo so this process is continuous we understand this process very well uh, through the dark matter only simulations uh, which uh, just uh, so they create what is called as a halo merger tree so suppose you have a halo today with a certain mass you can in the simulation trace back okay this halo formed by the merger of two halos one giga year in the past and each of these two halos formed by merger of two more halos five giga years in the past and so on so you can build in the simulations at least you can build a complete halo merger tree and compute all the properties of the halo what is its mass as a function of time and which halo what are its progenitors so those are called progenitor halos halos which gave birth to the halo that you see today so and there then of course then you throw in the baryons okay the gas will get accreted uh, stars will get uh, pulled in uh, unless of course they are sitting in a galaxy then they don't easily get pulled in by the neighboring halo because the gravity of the, the galaxy is 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 stronger but gas on the other hand uh, is moves about much more freely so in the intergalactic medium you have very few stars but you have a huge number huge amount of gas okay so one of the earliest uh, evidences that there was evolution so one of the things that will happen is if your star formation rate is changing as a function of time then the universe is said to be evolving it's not unchanged its properties change with time so what has been done here is that they've taken the luminosity function uh in different bands k band i band b band u band and so on and what is shown in every curve is the best fit uh, uh curve in uh, in this k band just superimposed on the data and shifted all of these are sort of arbitrarily shifted don't worry about the y axis shift okay uh, the, so look at this for example this is nb divided by 10 and nu divided by 100 just for convenience uh, it's it's not uh, direct numbers but what is important to see is that at the at the fainter magnitudes there is a deviation there is a change of in the luminosity function as you go from Uh, filter to filter so the number of galaxies per degree per magnitude changes as you go from one filter to the next now what does that indicate one possibility is that one is looking at different galaxies at at, at different rate shifts preferentially in the different bands So the K band is showing you one range of redshift, and I band is showing you something else, and so on, because of selection effects. But there could so there could this could just represent a evolution in uh, in the overall properties of the universe. Now, what are the two things that can evolve in a luminosity function? Okay, the luminosity function uh, usually does not change its basic functional form. Okay, but the parameters that define it okay the parameters of the luminosity function uh, at the faint end are defined by just two numbers what is the uh, faint end slope of the luminosity function and what is the normalization right uh, is the curve can move up and down or it can its slope can change over here like like we are seeing clearly there is a evolution of the faint end slope now it becomes 
very very difficult to disentangle what is the cause of this now you can you can move things up and down uh, that indicates that the number of galaxies has changed so for example i have a luminosity function but my many of my galaxies undergo a merger right what will that do that will reduce my number of faint galaxies but it will increase my number of bright galaxies and the total number will reduce so the integral of the luminosity function will be less that is one possibility okay so this is evolution of number density what is the other possibility let's say there are no mergers other extreme no mergers happen but still the luminosity function changes can it yeah ah, evolution time evolution so what can happen is suppose there are no mergers are happening galaxies are slowly aging right and their uh, colors are changing their star formation uh, density is 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 evolving and so on so these kind of things are referred to as luminosity evolution which means the galaxies don't undergo mergers etc their numbers remain constant but the luminosity of every galaxy over giga years it slowly changes the other option is what we discussed already which is referred to as density evolution a uh, luminosity evolution is measured in terms of just like we measured the star formation rate density uh, you measure the luminosity in terms of the total stellar luminosity a total amount of starlight total energy in starlight per co moving unit volume and density evolution is the number of galaxies that you have per co moving uh, unit volume this is extremely difficult to disentangle right if i give you two two lines which are sort of parallel right how would you know whether so let's say this represents one luminosity function this represents another how do you know whether this is because this particular line moved upwards or it moved to the left you don't know that that is the the main difficulty in disentangling the the, the density evolution and the uh, luminosity evolution this is particularly tricky at high redshifts because there there are all kinds of selection biases so uh, you may select one sample at redshift 3 another sample at redshift 4 and try to see if luminosity evolution or density evolution is happening and you can't because you're making wrong conclusions because the these galaxies are a completely different population from from this galaxy one population may be a euler population this is a dustless star forming galaxy population so you're not comparing apples to apples they're not connected in any way because when you do luminosity evolution over time you have to find the progenitors of these objects in order to find how the evolution is happening but because of very strong selection biases particularly at high redshift why at high redshift because in high redshift you are always biased the biggest bias that hits you Im immediately is your mamquist bias which is very severe on top of that there are other kinds of biases so for example it is very difficult we saw last time that to find a normal galaxy at redshift 3 is nearly impossible it doesn't mean they don't exist but the technology that we have today does not allow us to find such objects it al allows us to find star forming galaxies at redshift 3 without trouble but we can't find normal galaxies at redshift so all these biases become very important uh, at lower redshifts the luminosity functions can be compared to see which of these is dominant and how can you compare it because remember in the luminosity function there are two parts okay there is a, a bright end uh, cutoff okay, an exponential cutoff and then there is a faint end slope there's a power law at the faint end with an exponential cutoff in the luminosity function uh, remember this is sort of inverted from what we, these are bright galaxies these are uh, faint galaxies 
so uh, so the fact that you have a break in the luminosity function, the knee of the luminosity function is your L star luminosity, that gives you a feature. Once you have a line, instead of having two parallel lines, once you have something which is, uh, which is broken, which has a feature, then it becomes possible for you. You can, there's only one way of moving the thing uh, to get you to, to get two luminosity functions to match. And then you can actually compare that, okay, the slope has changed slightly. Okay, L star has changed slightly. The bright end uh, cutoff uh, is sharper or shallower. All that can be done. So if you can measure the luminosity function all the way from faint galaxies to bright galaxies, then you are in a better position to see which one of them is dominant. So you can say that, okay, in these two populations, at redshift 0.5 and 0.3, I made sure they are not selection biased. And then I've compared uh, luminosity evolution and density evolution. And I find that uh, there is 30% luminosity evolution, 20% density evolution. Very, very often you will have a combo because mergers do happen and galaxy evolution on its own also happens. So there is both a component of the change in the number density and the change in the luminosity. Okay, so this concludes more or less our discussion of the high redshift universe. Uh, there are many important aspects which I have not covered in this course because I believe they sh are properly should be properly covered in another course. Uh, that, uh, of course, which I mentioned earlier, the Lyman alpha absorbers, damped Lyman alpha systems, and Lyman limit systems. Uh, these are all basically subclasses of hydrogen absorbers along the line of sight to distant uh, background sources, uh, almost always quasars. And this should be covered in your uh, ISM IGM course, which will come in the, in the next quarter. So I have not covered that. Uh, one thing which is important, which should also are the various backgrounds that you have uh, in the sky. So far, we have been treating galaxies as individual resolved objects. But sometimes, uh, particularly in the far infrared, we are affected by something known as confusion limit. Do you guys know what has this been taught in, taught in the astrotechnics course? What is the confusion limit? Okay. So as you go to the far infrared uh, band, what typically happens, you get hit by your uh, resolution limit okay you have lambda by d right d is not increasing but lambda has increased uh, very much because of that the resolution that you are getting is very poor the beam becomes very large so what happens is if there are let us say 10 galaxies that are very close to each other in terms of their angular separation then they will all form into fall into your beam so when you measure the flux you will not measure the flux of each individual galaxy separately. You will measure the flux of all 10 galaxies added together. So this leads to uh, uh, confusion noise or a confusion bias. So what are we, why is it called confusion? Because you are not able to separate the disentangle those 10 galaxies. They're all confused. They are all there inside your beam. This is a very common problem. Uh, for the uh, in the far infrared and that will lead to what is known as a confusion bias confusion limit but it also leads to a, a diffuse background yeah uh, in the radio you do radio interferometry Okay, so typically you don't try, it would be very large in the radio if you just tried to build a single dish. So yes, you're, what you're saying is partially correct because single dish telescopes in the radio have very poor resolution, very large beams, and therefore uh, they are affected by confusion. But what has been done in the radio, uh, which again you will do in the Astrotechnics 2 course, 
is that we build radio interferometers where then the effective resolution becomes not the diameter of the dish but the di distance between the maximum distance between the two dishes so for the gmrt that is like 25 kilometers so that is quite large so although lambda is very larger than it is in the far infrared because of uh, aperture synthesis uh, radio interferometry we are able to improve the resolution it is not as good as optical or near infrared but it is not as bad as far infrared far infrared telescopes have to be in space so building far infrared interferometers is uh, very technically challenging so we have only single dish or single detector far infrared telescopes so now what this leads to this whole confusion it leads so not only will you when you measure a flux uh, you will measure the flux of 10 15 galaxies at one time when you try to measure the background what is meant by background background is the flux that you get from a part of the sky where there is no galaxy but with the confusion what happens is you you have a beam and there are uh, if you are detecting individual galaxies probably you would not have detected most of them or you would have detected them uh, as individual objects but now even if i point my far infrared telescope at a blank region of the sky i will pick up the added sum of very faint individual galaxies which are too faint to be individually detected but as when i add up their 10 uh, fluxes of 10 galaxies or 20 galaxies i will get a flux there so this is referred to as the cosmic infrared background how do you but the background can't come from blank sky it's not coming from the vacuum the background is coming from galaxies so if you can somehow one is uh, you work at a shorter wavelength so you're less affected or you build a better infrared bigger infrared telescope which is very hard but also has been done you will reduce your confusion limit you'll be able to resolve it and but you have to do the energy budgeting correctly in this whole game you have to say that okay there is so much of infrared background how many galaxies do i need of this this luminosity to produce this much background so again, if I am if I know the luminosity function in the far infrared at all redshifts, I can find out how many galaxies there should be in my beam. I can also go in the reverse direction, which is if I see so much infrared background, that means I must have so many galaxies. So this means that the luminosity function uh, should look like that. Of course, there are degeneracies there it is you're going from an integrated quantity to a differential quantity but there's no so there's no unique answer but there are models that try to explain the cosmic infrared background in this way meaning they they try to the model self consistently predicts what the luminosity function should be uh, and then you go and measure that luminosity function in some some fashion then uh, you'd be able to see consistently so this game of actually subtracting foregrounds or resolving foregrounds in the uh, study of cosmic backgrounds is a very big industry. It's a very big uh, uh, affair in astrophysics. The biggest one, of course, is the cosmic microwave background because that has a lot of implications to cosmology. So there have been a series of satellite uh, instruments uh, starting with COBE and WMAP and Planck and uh, CMB Paul and whatever. In the future, there will be more uh, of these CMB instruments. There, we 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 are able to model the foregrounds, uh, subtract them correctly in order to get the underlying signal which is coming from the distant universe. Yeah. Yes, but even you have infinitely many redshifts. You don't have infinitely many redshifts uh, because you can, you know, we know that galaxies, far infrared emitting galaxies don't exist beyond a certain distance because what tends to happen is most of the far infrared emission is coming from uh, dust recycling. I mean, there is dust. 
it absorbs the, uh, the radiation coming from hot stars, uh, it gets heated and then it re-emits re in the far infrared. That is the only make stars themselves don't emit in the far infrared directly. It's very weak. But this process, this recycling is so common that if you go and do a census of every photon in the universe, you see, tag every photon in the universe with its wavelength or energy, you will find that 50% of the photons are in the far infrared band. They don't constitute 50% uh, of the energy in photons because they are low energy photons, but in sheer number, 50% of the photons in the universe are in the far infrared. So that is why it's, uh, it, it's, it's something that needs to be the cosmic infrared background. Understanding it is a complex process. So there are many contributors to it from different redshift ranges, uh, different kinds of objects and so on. So you're right, it is, it, there is some amount of degeneracy, but it's not totally hopeless. It can be done, but uh, it can't be done perfectly at the present time. Yes, but the, if the thing is not evolving, so for example, if I take the luminosity function uh, at redshift 3 and I take the luminosity function at redshift 3.01, you don't expect to have a very drastic change, right? There's no measurable change. We have a 10% error in the measurement of our luminosity function. If this luminosity is fun changing function changes by half a percent, that you don't care about. That's why when you measure the luminosity function, you never measure it with that fidelity. What you measure it is okay at 3, 3.5, 4, 4.5. That's what you try. So you bin it. So therefore, you don't have infinite uh, redshifts. You have maybe 10, 15 bins, depending on what you have. Yeah. So the third kind of background, which is also uh, quite important, but is of course much weaker, is the cosmic X-ray background. So here also, the, uh, the situation, unlike the cosmic infrared background, which we are making slow progress, with the studies of the cosmic X-ray background, very rapid progress has happened in the last two or three decades due to the advent of new telescopes. And those new telescopes had much better resolution. Uh, so we'll come back to that uh, in a minute. So one sees uh, high supernova rates uh, in starburst galaxies. Okay, and what is that? Uh, so this is again a picture of M eighty two, which I had shown you in a in one of the previous lectures. Uh, this, of course, uh, the supernovae drive very strong winds. Uh, they can blow out uh, gas uh, from within the galaxy thereby uh, quenching the galaxy, but they can also lead to some enhanced star formation in regions due to shock compressions. So now the star formation happening in a galaxy, how do we measure the star formation? So now there are, have been, a, there are a number of techniques that are in use to measure the star formation rate. Okay? Because we, we said we want to measure the star formation rate density, but in order to do that, we have to measure the star formation rate. The sort of most accurate way of measuring the SFR is to do a full population synthesis model. But that is expensive in terms of, again, in terms of telescope time, because to build a good uh, population synthesis model, you have to measure the flux all the way from UV to far infrared in many bands. Uh, and that is uh, very difficult to do. So people have come up with proxies for the star formation. So one of the uh, proxies is uh, the star formation rate uh, as measured from the far infrared uh, luminosity. So this is the radiation emitted by warm dust, which is heated by hot young stars. For the relation of uh, FIR luminosity to the SFR, we have the following approximate relation. So by simply measuring the luminosity in the, in the far infrared, one can measure 
the star formation rate. Correct? Linear calibration, linear scale. It also turns out that there is, for star forming galaxies, a very tight correlation between the radio luminosity of galaxies and their luminosities in the far infrared. Over many orders of magnitude of the two luminosities. Since LFIR, luminous, uh, uh, far infrared luminosity, is a good indicator of the star formation rate, one can also use radio to measure uh, the star formation uh, rate. So there should be a similar linear calibration that connects uh, the 1.4 gigahertz, which is the most commonly observed radio frequency, 1.4 gigahertz uh, radio luminosity to the corresponding star formation. So this kind of calibration exists. The only thing to keep in mind is that in in the radio, uh, much of the emission is coming not from a supernova accelerated synchrotron particles, but it is coming from AGN driven uh, synchrotron emission. So you have to be able to disentangle what part of the radio emission is, is uh, non-thermal in nature uh, coming from the AGN source. And how much of it, this is also non-thermal, but it's coming from a star formation source. So the AGN source and star, but if you can disentangle that, then it becomes possible for you to uh, use the radio luminosity as a proxy for the star formation. Why, how will you disentangle this? What's the easiest way you can for, suppose I give you a radio emission, uh, radio image of a galaxy, right? And uh, I also give you image of the galaxy in whatever optical band, etc., etc., whatever you want. I've given you the redshift. How will you know whether this galaxy has predominantly AGN driven radio emission or star formation driven? Uh, yes, so that's, suppose you don't have the full spectrum. Uh, in the radio, whether it's star formation driven, it will, it will be shallower. You're right. So you can use the spectral index. The AGN will have a very steep spectral index. And the star formation driven one will have a much shallower spectral index. So if you measure it at different radio frequencies, you can do it. But much more easier is that remember the AGN, if there is an AGN present, you should uh, see either radio jets and lobes or very often emission from the core. If you don't see that, if you see no lobes, no jets, no emission from the core, but just diffuse emission from the disk of the galaxy, that indicates it's star formation driven. AGN is, is concentrated at the center. Star formation is distributed over a much wider region. Okay. So you can, you can measure the uh, radio infrared uh, correlation, not just by observing individual galaxies and measuring their far infrared and radio luminosities, but you can also stack. So you can take a population of galaxies, say, from the optical, whose redshift you know precisely from spectroscopy, and then take the corresponding radio and far infrared data and stack it. And then you will get an average spectrum in different redshift bins. So this is, all of these curves uh, represent the uh, the spectral energy distribution fit with a, uh, with a gray body power law. Okay? A gray body, a power law at lower frequencies and uh, shorter wavelengths and at longer wavelengths, a gray body. What's a gray body? It's related to black body, but uh, how?
a gray body huh, sorry yeah uh, emissivity is not one so it's not a perfect black body but it has a property just like black which it shares with black bodies is that the emissivity does not change as a function of temperature so the it is just a scaled version. It has the same Planck function, but it's just a scaled version of the Planck function. Uh, so that is what we are fitting there. And so in the far infrared, this is coming from the dust, dust emission. In the average, you stack many, many galaxies together. Uh, what can you say about the peak of the uh, of the spectrum as a function of redshift? So this is lowest redshift curve. And the top one is the highest redshift curve. It shifted towards towards a shorter wavelength, towards the lower wavelengths. What does that indicate? So what we are seeing here is that this peak is here, and by the time you go there, the peak has shifted to shorter wavelength. Yeah, temperature of what? No, this is not radio emission. This is a thermal black gray body that has been fitted to what? Not just the radio, far infrared radio, everything together. Right? In fact, this is just far infrared. There's no radio here. Temperature of the dust. See, remember, this is the dust peak. So much, this peak is caused by emission from the dust particles. So what seems to be happening is that the temperature of the dust is hotter at higher redshifts. Now, this again is tricky to interpret because of Bumpus biases. You will find more luminous galaxies only in your sample at redshift 1 compared to redshift 0 and therefore you will be biased you will uh, you will feel that okay those are more luminous their dust is hotter and so on but you are not doing a direct correct comparison so one should not try to over interpret this there is a trend and uh, it's there so that once you do this kind of modeling uh, you can get uh, you can make two kinds of plots. So this is the far inf uh, radio far infrared correlation. Here we measured the radio at one frequency and we measured the uh, far infrared luminosity at 70 microns, also at one frequency. Okay. This, we are doing it slightly differently. We are using the, we are calculating the total far infrared luminosity, which means the area under the SED in the far infrared region. And we are comparing that with the monochromatic uh, radio luminosity at 1.4 gigahertz. And uh, so we won't go into the details of this, but you can see that over many orders of magnitude. Uh, so these stars indicate the galaxies that we have in our sample. Uh, which uh, goes from 10 raised to 9 uh, solar luminosities all the way to about 10 raised to 12. And uh, beyond, there are data points from the literature going another three orders of magnitude. So over about six, seven orders of magnitude, the far infrared correlation for star forming galaxies holds. And how do we know these are star forming? Because we have rejected all the galaxies that have an AGN in them. So we have a spectrum for every galaxy. So we throw out all the AGNs and we only look at stuff. Ah, the, the, these two points are typical error bars. So they're not the data. So the uh, star point over here, I think, corresponds to our errors or typical errors on our measurements. And this other one corresponds to the typical um, errors on the measurements in the literature. So they're not, they're not part of the data. So quite remarkable. So once, if you can nail it, and radio surveys are very fast. They're very cheap to do. Uh, large area radio surveys at 1.4 gigahertz have been done over vast regions of the sky. So you can estimate the star formation rate, provided you weed out the AGNs. Uh, you can measure the star formation rate over uh, 
quite easily with the radiometer. You can measure the uh, star formation rate with the H alpha line. Uh, this is line emission com uh, coming from hot gas surrounding the newly born stars. Uh, these are young and hot, lots of radiation getting generated, getting absorbed by the birth cloud in which they are there. And that birth cloud then emits uh, strongly in Lyman alpha, Lyman beta, H alpha, H beta, etc. Uh, so if you measure the H alpha line, which falls in the optical band, uh, you can measure the star formation rate. For high redshift galaxies, you can do the same with Lyman alpha emission line. And we looked at some point when we were saying that Lyman alpha emission lines can be an effective probe of high redshift galaxies. You just tune your narrow band filter to the redshift range you want, uh, where the redshifted H alpha line should lie, and there you'll pick up lots of galaxies at that redshift. There's lots of good work being done with the Subaru telescope in this area. Uh, so that's it. So again, this has been calibrated from, from mostly local data. There is always the fear that these calibrations are mostly done in the local universe. Do these calibrations hold in the distant universe? They have, there are many concerns like that. You have to be a little careful. So for example, uh, the radio far infrared correlation uh, should break down at very high rate because the radio emission may still be there. It anyway escapes whether there is dust or no dust. But the far infrared uh, luminosity is very sensitive to the amount of dust. If there is a large amount of dust, the far infrared luminosity will be high. And if there is low amount of dust, the far infrared luminosity can be very low. It can be zero. If there is no dust, there is no far infrared emission. Uh, so one has to be very careful about that. So there is a complementary way of measuring to the far infrared is in a low dust situation, you can measure the uh, instantaneous star formation rate very, very effectively by measuring the UV luminosity. So there is, by measuring the lumi, uh, UV luminosity, you can calculate the star formation rate. Uh, but this, remember, will work where the escape fraction of the UV photons is quite high which means there's very little dust. So whatever UV photons are getting generated into the star are escaping the galaxy and reaching us. So we can measure the UV luminosity. If the star is dust, if the galaxy is dusty, then the UV luminosity would be very low. And therefore you'll estimate a very low uh, star formation rate in the UV by the UV calibrator. But you may do better in the far infrared. So there is, there are now some people uh, who have proposed and uh, many people are using it that don't take the star formation rate uh, as in one band either uv or far infrared just add them so the star formation rate in the uv plus the star formation rate in the fir should be considered as your star formation rate so one is uh, coming from the so you're doing some sort of energy balance basically whatever photons get uh, escape directly to you, give you the UV star formation rate. Whatever photons get absorbed by the dust and emit in the far infrared will give you the far infrared emission. So if you have properly calibrated uh, star formation rate indicators, then you can simply add them to get the total star formation. Uh, nevertheless, there are attempts now to compare the different uh, star formation rates. So I say, okay, I'll take one galaxy, I'll measure the UV luminosity, calculate the star formation rate for the same galaxy, I'll measure it H alpha luminosity, I'll calculate the star formation rate and I'll compare, see how they go. So these are various uh, comparisons, uh, H alpha star formation rate uh, far versus far infrared, 1.4 gigahertz versus uh, H alpha and so on. And as you can see that there is a lot of scatter and more worryingly, the slope is not one. So there is, there is some, some issues here which indicate that uh, the star formation rate, uh, measuring it correctly, 
is via just a single frequency indicator is going to be a tricky business. So uh, I'll cover one more topic and stop. So, so far the star formation rate indicators that we looked at in the optical like H alpha, in the UV, in the far infrared, in the radio, etc. Those were uh, the commonly used indicators over the last 30, 40, 50 years. But something new has become available in recent times. So there is a fine structure line of singly ionized carbon at 157.7 microns. It's one of the brightest emission lines in galaxies and which can account for a fraction of a percent of their total luminosity is just sitting in this single one line. Very, very strong line. Uh, it, it is commonly seen in star forming galaxies and it is produced in regions which are subject to UV radiation from hot stars. And due to its wavelength, this line is very difficult to observe. So the earth uh, is very, very unkind uh, to us at this wavelength, the atmosphere, very, very difficult to observe. And so far was detected only so far, meaning until about 10 years ago, was detected in star forming regions in our galaxy, which are very close and bright, and in other local galaxies like Andromeda. But now all that has changed with the advent over the last decade or so of this Atacama Large Millimeter Array Telescope. And this is a telescope that has uh, the ability to observe this line, uh, especially at high redshift. So suppose you're looking at a redshift 4 star forming galaxy. Uh, this should go to, to a submillimeter wavelength. And there, uh, ALMA is very, very sensitive. And it's, uh, it is sensitive because it is located at on a plateau which is located at an altitude of 5,000 meters. It's the highest uh, ground based observatory uh, and also located at a site. Much of the problem is caused by the presence of water vapor in the atmosphere. So the water vapor uh, uh, produces so many lines at 157 uh, microns that you can't uh, see anything. But what ALMA does, is it does two things. First of all, it looks mostly at high redshift uh, galaxies. So this, uh, the water is not redshifted, but the uh, galaxy line is. So it doesn't get affected by the water vapor lines. Uh, but the water vapor lines are also present at other redshifts, uh, at other wavelengths. So uh, what it does is that it goes to a site which is one of the driest places on earth. There are some weather stations in Chile which have never recorded rainfall. Never means last hundred years they're waiting for rain to fall and it has not fallen. So it is that dry completely. So they measure the precipitable water vapor and that indicates that it's very, very dry. And therefore one can observe without too much interference from the water lines. Uh, with ALMA. Yeah. Yes, so you don't go very high. You go to redshift two, three. Years. But there is, as I already indicated in one of the previous lectures, there seems to be, at least in some galaxies, a very, very rapid increase in mass, a very, very rapid increase in metallicity, and so on. So, you won't find high metallicity galaxies everywhere in the universe at a high redshift like we do now. But you will still find a few individual objects which have a high metallicity. So uh, evolved stars. So it is not that uh, uh, you don't have uh, you don't have any dust. You don't have any emission light. Yeah, so they, they look at special, uh, ALMA also has a relatively small field of view, very high resolution. So it looks at individual galaxies typically, hard to do large area surveys. Yeah, so I'm going to stop here.
we'll have the next class on friday uh, i hope there's no disruption on that but uh, what i'll do is the last lecture i think i'm going to take on the uh, friday following so i'll take a lecture next monday and then tuesday wednesday we will have our seminars and on friday i'll take